So thank you very much everyone for coming. My name is um, finding your virtual way. My name is Tobias Planka. I'm one of the uh, members of the team of the Humane AI Research Priority Area at the University of Amsterdam. The Humane AI is all about the kind of social cultural impact of AI. We have come up during um, COVID with this idea of the kind of virtual Humane AI conversations. This is the sixth one in this row of events. Um, the last one was about a month ago um, with the Statistics Bureau Netherlands about responsible AI, but this one is probably the most cultural or humane of all of our conversations up to now because we will talk today about cultural AI. So, and it's my great delight to introduce um, our two conversationists, if that's an English word, I'm not entirely sure. Um, Giovanni Colavizza is an uh, assistant uh, professor at uh, UVA and he will um, lead the discussion. And our valued guest today is Marike von Erb, Dr. Marike von Erb, who is the director of the Cultural AI Lab. Then all I'm left to say is that uh, this uh, meeting will be recorded, but because it's a webinar, uh, don't worry. Uh, you will probably never be seen unless you are one of us, um, the three of us. And the other thing is that if you are interested in the Humane AI uh, research priority area, please visit our website, uh, humane-ai.nl. And with this, I hand over to Giovanni. Thank you. Thank you, Tobias. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, everybody that is attending. And good afternoon. Now, uh, the, the way this will unfold is that we will have a very a relatively short presentation by Marike at the beginning, and then I have a few questions for her, and then we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. So this is my first reminder to you to please use the Q&A functionality of Zoom or the chat, if you prefer that, to ask any question uh, you might uh, like to Marike. So we'll collect them and then uh, ask. Now, uh, just before beginning, I'll give the full title and full affiliations of Marike. So Dr. Marike van Herb, uh, very much welcome today with us, is the research group leader of the Digital Humanities Laboratory, which is part of the Humanities Cluster at the Royal Arts and Sciences Academy. And Marike is also the scientific co-director of the recently launched Cultural AI Laboratory and whose mission and activities uh, I believe she will introduce uh, today. So Marika, thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thank you so much for having me. I'm gonna see if I can share my screen, if that's gonna work. Uh, you should be seeing a keynote presentation. Do you see just the slide or do you see the next slide coming up? Also the next slide. Okay, I need to move my screens around um, just do that um, doo -doo -doo. so I just have loads of so that. sorry no I just have two screens here so that's always it's always a, a bit of a surprise how zoom is gonna respond Perfect. Well, it doesn't, yeah, okay. Um, so the Culture AI Lab, well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. Um, uh, you know, we talk to Toby, Els and I and Giovanni, we, we, you know, our offices are really close by, so uh, we have talked to the past and uh, um, it's really nice to sort of get to know a bit more about the, the, the RPA uh, Humane AI here and uh, to maybe also get to know some of, some of you a bit more through your questions. Um, and I hope you get as enthusiastic about culture AI as, as we are. Um, so, um, Giovanni also already said it. Uh, I'm one of the uh, one of the three scientific directors. Uh, my other partners in crime are Laura Holling, uh, research group leader at CWI, and Jakob van Ossenbrugge, who leads a research group at the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Um, and well, really, what we want to do is we want to uh, to study. Um, and also, you know, bring further these AI systems uh, and, and really see how we can bring cultural values and, and really the complexity of human culture into these systems. Because um, 
there is a tension between uh, humanities research often and, and, and AI, uh, computer science, in that you know, humanities research is, is really about, um, about the complexities of the, of the world and, and human thought and human product. Whereas in order to make a computer deal with it, you kind of have to, have to like flatten it uh, because computers really like boxes. Um, and they like it black or white and not just like on a spectrum where it's sort of a sliding scale. Um, and of course we needed that in order to get the computer systems where we're at now, but in order to really tackle real world problems, we now need to make these systems smarter so they can deal with more than just black and white, um, but that they can deal with all these different shades of, of reality and, and real data. And uh, the thing we, we, we come across here that, that we have encountered in our work is that um, we find these, we find difficulties at, at these different levels of bias, of ethics, of cultural differences and perspectives. Um, you know, this is a very, very short introduction, so I can't get into everything, uh, but we really want to make this sort of two-way traffic. And also, um, if you have been spending some time in digital humanities, you, you very often also see that it's, it's, it's a bit of one-way traffic, really, where a humanities researcher uh, wants to use AI technology, wants to use um, com computational methods. Um, but it, it's not always that the, the humanities knowledge is fed back into these AI systems to make them better. Um, and that's something that we would like to, um, to change with this lab. Um, the title of this talk is, is Building Cultural AI. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously we launched officially in, in, in February, but this lab has been in the making for longer. And we had all these fantastic ideas of our PhD students and researchers spending time at academic and heritage partners. Well, as it happens, um, they mostly spend time at home and Zoom. Um, we sometimes try to, you know, meet each other, go for walks, have a coffee. Um, hopefully we can, um, we can start having um, these kind of uh, real, uh, you know, face-to-face -face conversations where we, um, we really sit together and work together because we do think that is the most important thing and that's also how we set up this lab. I mean, not to say that we haven't been doing um, pretty cool stuff, if I can say so myself, the past couple of months, but... Um, um, these things really thrive with, with real collaboration. So it's also not the idea that, you know, you have a meeting for an hour and then you go back to your respective offices, but really have the computer scientists share an office with humanities research and share an office with the museum professionals um, or the librarian or the, the curators in order to really get this understanding of the different aspects of the problem. Um, we currently have a bunch of uh, projects uh, that were funded um, that have already started as well. Um, Better Mod started in September already. Um, Culturally Aware AI and Sabio started in January. Reframe started in March and uh, we're still working on uh, the other two. And I think there's also a PhD student um, at UVA who's gonna start in September. Um, so we're growing and we're also still trying to get money from all sorts of different parties to grow our, our lab um, and to really work with the different partners um, and, and bring in more different uh, collections and, and problems. Also, not we don't want to grow indefinitely, um, but a bit of mass uh, helps to, uh, to take on these kind of problems. So uh, we've defined four different research topics. Uh, the first one is context and connections. So we really want to see how we can uh, contextualize collection objects um, and link them to each other uh, and across collections and information sources. And, and here you see that, um, you know, museums have been keeping meticulous records of, um, of the objects that they have in their collections. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a collection database and it has very, very short descriptions of things. Um, but of course, there's a bigger story that all these collection objects tell. It's the story of why something is in a museum collection and another object isn't. Um, there's all sorts of interesting things. We call a painting by Rembrandt. We actually mention the, the painter. 
But if it's a mosaic created by maybe a, 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 a Buddhist monk somewhere, we call it a, a, craft, a piece of craft by Buddhist monk and, and they're anonymous. So there is also all these values that are, are um, sort of implicit in these descriptions um, that in order to fully understand it and also fully um, appreciate um, these museum collections, you kind of need to know. So we want to make these things explicit. Um, and that also has to do with, you know, trust and polyphony and politicality. You know, the example I gave, the, the Rembrandt versus something created by a monk in a different, from a different culture, we tend to value certain expressions of artistry um, are valued differently say than than others so um how do you make that explicit um and also how do you make those voices um that are maybe less um well represented um in data sets or maybe less frequently represented how you how can you bring those to the fore um as these collections have been grown over years and years and years sometimes even even centuries um we have to deal with variation in, in language for example, older spelling variants, but also older terminology that we wouldn't necessarily use anymore today. Um, one of the things we're currently working on, uh, which is super exciting, we, we got a small grant from uh, Europeana to create a corpus of contentious terms in context, um, where we take um, newspaper articles over a period uh, of, of a couple of hundred years and look for terminology that um, that is sensitive now or considered maybe not good to use anymore. I'm thinking, for example, in English of the N-word um, that, you know, in the 50s and 60s was perfectly normal, but it's not acceptable anymore to use that. Um, so if you mark those up in newspapers, because of course they were printed then, um, and we hope to then build a system that can sort of detect terms that are um, maybe sensitive and in that way we can help make this sort of thing more visible. Um, but how do you deal with that across time and space? Um, so because certain terms in certain contexts are okay and in other contexts are not okay. Um, well and then how do we make this you know useful to users and insightful? Um, so we're also working with um, interface designers to do these uh, kind of things to bring this to the practice. Um, I should speed up a little bit. Um, there's different layers of bias, and maybe in the in the in the questions we can talk about that a bit more. But there's you know, uh, and it's it's very hard to deal with that. We we don't want to erase it. I think that would be a mistake because you can't change the data that was created 200 years ago. Um, so you have to do something with that. But it, we shouldn't erase it. Um, bias can be introduced by two creators simply because they look at the world from a particular perspective. Um, and we want to make sure that um, uh, we want to mitigate this as much as possible. So we also want to work with different groups in developing those tools. And also certain tools just have an inherent bias, like a lot of machine learning is very much based on statistics, um, which has certain consequences for your analyses. So just to give you an example, uh, this didn't come from out of nowhere. Um, also this lab, so Jakob and Osselbrucker, for example, worked on, uh, on, on this paper before with, with Miriam Traub and, and other colleagues. And this is really, you know, it, it really shows what, uh, what we're dealing with. So they looked at the uh, National Library's newspaper archive uh, and their server logs. And um, they reran user queries um, through the search engine that they had. And they looked at how often certain documents appeared in the top 10 or 100 or 1,000 and then looked at the retrieval counts. Now, the majority of the articles, and this is a pretty, you know, quite a few queries here, never, never make it to the top 10 and, you know, 96% and then 76% never makes it to the top 100. So, you know, there's this big, big long tail problem and there's all this interesting data that people never see. Um, so, you know, there's some things that are inherent to the way the, the system is set up. So very short, very long documents hardly ever show up. Um, and also you sort of see that, you know, a lot of queries are about names. You know, people do look at like, what did my uncle do or whatever. So you do see particular article types coming up. Um, well, if you know this, you can, you know, can guide users to 
know, explore different parts of the collection, or you can rethink your, um, your ranking algorithms, um, but you'd have to know this. So we're just sort of trying to, to um, investigate what's happening in this space. And I just want to highlight briefly uh, one of the projects we're working on, the Social Bias Observatory, which is funded by the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, highly recommend looking into that network they're doing amazing stuff they're also organizing really really cool events like currently online hackathons um, but they also do hopefully real life hackathons again soon um, national museum for world culture and national museum for world cultures which is a collaboration between these four museums african museum museum volkkunde middle museum and top museum and digital humanities lab um, and um, yeah, we're also here looking at these, these contentious terms um, that come from the Words Matter document that was compiled by um, professionals. They looked at like, well, what kind of terminology is there? And um, Valentin is a researcher in my lab. Um, he's looking at how do, we, how do we make sense of this data? And then he started, um, you know, also from the perspective that our, our, our process and our algorithms, in order to make bias and data insightful, also our method should be insightful. So instead of taking the latest and greatest um, deep learning algorithm, we start with just, well, what happens if we just take pointwise mutual information and just see what happens? Um, and just look at, you know, what kind of space do I get there? Um, and we looked at biograms and, and those kind of things. And this is just, just a visualization of the space. Tomorrow we're gonna have a meeting with um, uh, the, the, the front-end developer that we're also working in from Sudox. Uh, I didn't have the logo on the previous slide. Um, and then in a few weeks, we're going to have a workshop with museum professionals to see how a system that pinpoints certain uh, potentially uh, sensitive things in, in your data, um, what kind of visualizations work, where in their process, in, in their daily practice of working, would something like that fit? Um, so we really want to look at these things from all the different angles, the different parties involved, the different disciplines. Um, and we want to make our process and algorithms uh, democratic, accessible, durable, transparent, scalable, and reproducible. Um, so we're also working on a manifesto. And, and Savio is a small project, uh, but we want to use it as a blueprint so others can use it as well. Um, so hopefully you'll hear more about that and uh, I'll shut up now so we can go to the questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marika. This is really exciting and also uh, really ambitious, which I, I, I <laughs> like very much. So that's, that's great. Uh, before I jump to questions, I have many of them. Uh, let me just remind the audience uh, that if they would like to ask any question using the Q&A functionality or the chat, they are very welcome to do so and we will pick them up as they come. Um, so my hand, well, uh, maybe the first question that I have is um, related to the, to the Cultural AI Initiative. Right? I'm curious to, uh, to know what prompted you to get it going. So what did you see in this moment in time in research mm. and in particular in cultural institutions, right? They are, so, they are so core to the project right. that prompted you uh, to start this, this initiative. I, I think I think a bunch of things came together. So there were some uh, some some strategic considerations, just how the Dutch research landscape was developing, and and you know we talked to funding agencies, and and we hear things about you know directions they they want things to go. Um, I mean, we actually have a long history of working with cultural heritage institutions uh, in the Netherlands. So uh, between two thousand and five and two thousand, like to say fifteen. There was the Continuous Access to Cultural Heritage uh, Research Program funded by the Dutch Research Council, um, where they, they uh, funded a whole bunch of projects um, where they, you had to have a PhD student, a postdoc, and a programmer uh, working actually the majority of their time at, at a cultural heritage institution. Um, and I did my PhD in one of those, and also my first postdoc. Um, so, so part of the network was already there. And then we had uh, Claria, the uh, Common Labs and Research Infrastructure for Humanities, uh, big, big infrastructure project. Um, but then we also saw that it's an infrastructure project, right? So um, how, do we, how do we take this 
and and bring it to research. And then we just started talking to well, Yako and I first started talking, and then you know the National Library and Center of Vision and Rijks Museum got involved, and you know, and just because because you know we sort of knew each other and we were talking to each other at you know receptions we still had then. It's like yeah, because we working on this really cool thing, and and that sort of that's the best way to to grow these things, right? So then we had this idea. Um, and sort of grew organically. Um, I mean, Yako and I, we used to be together at the VU. We, you know, our offices were just in the same corridor. Um, and then we were like, okay, we've got this great idea. Um, how do we, how do we, you know, get it going? Get, get the ball rolling, uh, roll, um, get the snowball thing going. And then we, you know, started writing these project proposals, project proposals, project proposals. Um, and, and luckily, uh we got some project funded so so we could actually you know take this idea and, and just you know put some some hour man hours woman hours onto it uh, to, to really get going so i think it was just the right time of you know things coming together and and you know technologies being you know collection digitization being at a, at a great stage um the national library having an ai agenda um it seemed the right time yeah no, absolutely. I think that's also what I have seen in my, in my much, much shorter experience in the Netherlands um, is that there is, of course, a, a strong sensibility for, for emerging societal issues on the part of cultural organizations and, of course, us researchers. And um, you, made, uh, you made a point, well, you, you touched upon many of them, but one uh, that I find particularly challenging and compelling is that of bias. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I really like the way you framed it because uh, well, for two reasons. One is that because you acknowledge that there are layers of bias, right? So there are different sources that, that might contribute to, uh, to biasing an AI system. And that already creates a problem because disentangling them and understanding them is complicated. But the second reason that I really like your approach um, is that you, you, you said, well, you know, let's try to understand. What, uh, what is this bias, if there is bias and what it is before jumping to trying to fix it in some, in some way, right? And I think that's, a, you know, the, the idea of surfacing bias, making it visible is a very compelling one to me that I believe is also underexplored. So, uh, so that, that I think is great. Um, and I would like to ask you um, both in terms of the methodologies um, and also in terms of how you plan to convey uh, this information about bias to users uh, of AI systems. Would you like to tell us a little bit more about your plans there, what you're doing or plan to do? So, yeah, so, so methodologies, I, I, I briefly mentioned it in, in the presentation as well. So, I mean, one of the things that, um, you know, everyone is, is doing deep learning now, but it's this black box, right? You can't, you can't trace it. Now, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't use those things, but um, I think that you should um, you should look at different approaches. So because you know different you know running a different uh, different algorithms on the same data set will give you different insights. You know some will give you maybe a better performance for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, but if you look at what is actually happening, uh, you know which things do they get right, which things do they get wrong. Uh, you know, what kind of, if you do some old fashioned machine learning um, with, you know, which features are the most important versus um, which are, let, contribute less. So um, um, I think, I think you, I mean, this is, for example, Emily Bender, uh, um, who was one of the authors in the Stochastic Parrots paper, so keeps saying, let's bring linguistics back into computational linguistics. Um, and I think that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, AI research is is very often uh, very uh, methods focused, but not necessarily understanding the data exactly and the domain exactly. And uh, so we want to, on the one hand, you know, to to mitigate maybe some of that technological bias, try out different things and see what's happening. Also, bring in the knowledge of the domain expert. So from the museum professional who knows that data set in and out, who works with that every day, and who can tell you why a particular thing is the way it is. 
um, or who could tell you, well, this might be a good way to transform maybe your data, and this isn't based on what I know as a, as a curator and what I know about this domain, um, or this could be the humanities research to say, yeah, but you can't say that, for example, if you want to do, I don't know, lemmatization or, or you want to do, you know, transforming something about synonyms. Um, so that was the first part uh, about the, met the methods. And the second part of your question. It was about conveying that information to users. Or right, AI right, right. Systems or otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly tricky because um, we sometimes don't even understand our own systems uh, in that much detail, or we can't tell them like, well, the system says this because we started here and then this happened and this and this and this and this and this. Um, I think you should try, strive to get the provenance trail as much as possible. Um, so yeah, we don't have that solved yet. I mean, we officially started uh, this year. Of course, we have ideas. Um, Jakob and Osborne, for example, he has worked on a project before where they tried to create a dashboard, basically, where you, mm -hmm. you know, if you do X on the, uh, you know, if you do this, then this will change in your results. But, you know, if you've got like 100 different parameters. Um, um, the other thing is just, you know, involve people in the project. Involve them from the start. So we're having this workshop for Sabio in, in a few weeks. Not because our system is done yet, but because we want to know from the users um, what, assist, what they need from a system. And then we're probably going to have to tell them, yeah, we can't do everything. But um, yeah, and I mean, we're, we're also very much focused on, on the museum professionals for now. Um, bringing that to a wider audience is, is a whole other challenge um, that, uh, that that we need to think about. Although there you can think of um, going via the museum professionals. They, I mean, they already have this task of translating sometimes very complicated things like the Wright Museum uh, has a slavery exhibition, right? And they had a really awesome webinar uh, last week. Um, how to translate those things to the users so they can also be the intermediate where we do all sorts of things on their data side and find all these bias and things and, and through the, the curators either in the museum uh, halls or online, how do you present that to users? Um, one of our PhD students, uh, Andre Nesterov, is going to be working on, on data stories. Um, we're not quite sure yet uh, whether that's going to be for the general audience or, or also more for professionals, but you know, that's all part of the still trying to figure stuff out. So I, I, I don't have all the answers at the moment. Oh, fair enough, absolutely. I mean, they're very, very tricky questions. Um, such as my next question to you, which uh -oh. is also quite, quite tricky. And um, so you, you mentioned the goal of um, essentially bringing uh, or developing AI systems that have a better cultural awareness. Yeah. Um, now, uh, as we, as we well, many of us know, uh, the, the way AI people or, you know, the, the machine learning, let's say machine learning people uh, like to work is by having very measurable goals right so usually they have clear tasks they even have shared tasks they can compete or we can compete on trying to crack something that is very well defined and we have a precise measurable outcome that we're trying to improve on um, instead objectives such as you know having a better cultural awareness they are intrinsically much more difficult to define right uh, it's, it's probably impossible or very difficult at least to measure them exactly now, I think this is part of the reason why sometimes there is a little bit of a tension between the two communities, right? Because uh, uh, um, common or, you know, sometimes critique that is found uh, by machine learning people to uh, humanities people is that, you know, you critique a lot, but mm -hmm. can you bring about some solution to it, right? Can you, uh, can you actually uh, tell us what we could do in order to improve our systems? So my question to you is, uh, what would it take? So what, what do you have in mind um, and what would it take for you to say, okay, this AI system is working better because it is more culturally aware. So how do you think about the evaluation, if it even makes sense, mm -hmm. of something like, um, like this goal? Well, I think, I think there are 
various dimensions that we can use to um, to evaluate our systems on. And um, I mean, that's that's one of the reasons why I uh, I like working with humanities. Actually, is that they look beyond the precision recall and F measure scores um, that you know the, the, the fundamental computer scientists uh, you know like to report. Um, because there's a story behind those scores. Now, the th problem is only that probably for this task that we set ourselves, how, how do we even, we probably can't even figure out how to score it like that. Although, um, I mean, the example I, I showed in my, in my brief presentation about um, just looking at, you know, how much of the long tail can you bring up? when you do a query um, and uh, in the long tail you can for example also imagine that you know there's different segments um, that you know maybe correspond to a different user group and i think that's uh, maybe also something that um, the project of ryan Brait, who's another one of our PhD students is working on is how how to get these multiple perspectives um, i mean the end goal would be that if someone goes to a museum uh, who previously didn't recognize themselves in the museum exhibition because it, for example, uh, is very much presented from, say, a very white colonial perspective. If that person goes to the museum and they feel represented, and that is because, you know, in the process leading up to creating that exhibition, our system suggested um, particular things to show or particular ways of presenting um, the objects. I think that would be a huge thing. Um, and, you know, that can be measured maybe in a different way, right, through uh, user surveys, people visiting museums. Um, so, yeah, we're thinking, I think, and I think we need to think of these hybrid evaluations of, of systems. I think Tobias wanted to say something. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it was just my, my, my fat fingers, but I was very, if I, if I may, so that's also okay. I'm very happy to say something. If I'm, if I'm allowed to say something, I'm also going to say something. I thought you so, raised your hand. No, that, that was yeah. just me, so say, trying to get my fingers out of the way of the Zoom <laughs> interface. But anyway, so after I recorded all this for, forever on YouTube, um, I'm very interested because, you know, the, the word that I come from, you know, also I joined the Netherlands at the same time when Giovanni came, I had six months before the pandemic started, so I haven't actually experienced kind of Dutch research culture very much, not very much yet. It's very interesting to say because, you know, in, in, in the world where I come from, which is the UK, it was always kind of much more separated between computer science and humanities. So there was, in a way, a specialized sub-area, digital humanities, you can call that, or whatever. Um, and then these still humanities want to also be humanities, you know, so, and I have the feeling now this seems to be a much more productive dialogue within, within these kind of initiatives that you have mentioned, Marike, over the last kind of, since you said we started, you can saying about 2005, right? So a catch. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's when I started my, my PhD. Um, I find it amazing to so say, oh, you also, you would not find a computer scientist in the, in, um, in Britain who would be particularly interested in processing heritage corrections. So, mm. I mean, apart from kind of people who are interested maybe in human computer interaction design, but maybe not people who work on machine learning in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know the, uh, the, the, the entire history of this. Um, I mean, for that, you, uh, you could, for example, ask Antal von der Bosch, who, uh, who I think, uh, you know, he was one of the, 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 the people who started, um, who got one of the first projects in, uh, in, 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 in the CATCH proje uh, program. Um, but I think, I think we just got really lucky there that the research council, you know, made this decision and, uh, and you really see that the network they built then with, I think it was 15 or 20 projects. And they also really did this, you know, have the projects, even though they were wildly different, um, you know, one was about, uh, handwriting recognition, uh, there were, you know, recommender systems. Um, I was doing, uh, information extraction, uh, people were doing computer vision. Um, uh, you know, they also had like regular sessions where, you know, you present your work to each other. 
uh, and also you know, talk to each other and have the PG students talk together, work together. They also had the developers you know, uh, work together on, on some shared things. One of the things they also did afterwards which was really good is to have some extra financing to turn some of the prototypes that we created during the projects into software products. Um, so, so, so the, this ecosystem started and um, I mean, I think there's, there's a few things like the EU has, um, has some, some interesting uh, uh, grants that, uh, that are also, you know, cultural heritage and AI. Uh, it's just a shame that the competition is so ridiculous and it's just so hard to get um, this kind of money. Um, that's a whole other topic that we probably should park here. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh we got really lucky there and, and i hope that that this stays on the agenda like this because you really really see um that it makes the ai better and and it it also you know um uh, it, it really helps in, in unlocking all these amazing collections that that we have for for anyone really mm -hmm. can i so i see there's now a question coming in. So do you think, can I quickly ask a follow-on question? So do you think the cultural AI lab in a way is a culmination then of all these activities and is now also maybe the center of this or? Um, I mean, the culmination sort of means that you're almost done, right? But in, we no, still I mean, have so course, much to do. Of course. No, sorry, um, but, I mean, I, I think, I think we're, we're definitely on one of the continuations of this, but um, I, I hope we're definitely not the culmination yet. No, no, I mean, in the sense of all this preparation of work, but again, the same people come together and yeah, now maybe, but we also this. really want to bring in new people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry. No, don't be. I think thanks, Tobias, for the intervention. Um, so I'll pick up one question that we have in the Q&A, um, Marike, and uh, this is by Tone van den Dol. I, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing. Uh, first of all, great presentation. And the question is about um, your uh, answer that you just gave and the example of the museum exhibition, right? And, uh, and the selection of uh, materials for the exhibition and, and what else. And uh, Town is asking, uh, in this example, uh, which is a very good example, I would say, uh, whose success is measured? Mm -hmm. Because all these, all the individuals that have, uh, so it could be all the individuals that have an opinion about the exhibition. Perhaps they have, uh, they came to it. Um, but um, the point is that by measuring this, we might also have some form of bias. For example, because the sample is not representative of a certain population. Uh, so how to tackle this, and um, and maybe uh, a solution could be to to have a system that asks for feedback and also new insights. Uh, to to attendees, but I don't know whether you have uh, any idea. Yeah, so this. I mean, the, the example is definitely something that um, that's more for the for, for the longer term, right? Um, what I can say is that um, I'm I'm involved in another project as well um, uh, called Ojiropa, and as part of that, uh, we're trying to uh, bring uh, uh, olfactory heritage uh, into um, uh, into the AI realm and also museums. So I know for that project we have um, uh, we have a plan <laughs> to create surveys, um, and we have a fantastic team um, uh, at University College London um, who, who who do this and and you know who know how to set up these surveys. You really need professionals for that, and you've got ethics committees uh, dealing with that. Um, but I think that. Um, the question is, should you measure it the way we measure success of AI systems? I mean, if you can, if you can, and, and that's, that's the thing with culture, right? Like last week I got to go to the museum again because they opened for a couple of days and, um, uh, you know, we did this whole testing thing, you know, to try to see what the analysis is like, and just, you know, being at the museum makes someone really happy, you know, and if you can make someone happy at a museum, um, who would otherwise maybe not go to a museum or goes walks away feeling bad then you know maybe you don't need to have a well 50% of our people were happy and thought this was a good idea and 35% didn't really have an opinion so I would say that that kind of testing would be part of the um, more qualitative 
thing. And there you can do all sorts of things with, um, uh, you know, also get particular user groups, invite them, um, instead of just asking random uh, people. Um, so I, I think we need to think of evaluating our systems also in a more holistic way. Um, if it also means that um, a curator, um, uh, you know, can be, you know, there, there's, there's also all these unconscious bias uh, classes, for example, for managers and those kind of things. But, you know, there's also bias in all these collections. If we can, you know, have this system that collection managers can more easily detect bias in their systems um, or anyone else, um, you know, you could also think of, um, you know, and flagging it, right? Um, and if that, um, that leads to more pleasant, uh, uh, work conversations or, you know, in eventually to better data and um, fewer people who, who feel offended by particular things. Um, of course, we shouldn't completely get rid of uh, friction in society, but um, uh, really have to fix. So, so I'm a bit, yes, I think that's one tool in the toolbox, I guess, in the short answer. And we need to do it right with the kind of people who have been doing this, who know how to set this up properly and i'm not one of those um i just know where to find them um and then we should look into all the different dimensions of our data and our tools um to see what can we measure and also what can we what can't we measure um and there you know for for one of the things we're doing now creating this corpus uh, we're also looking into crowdsourcing and um, there was a whole research line um, at the Free University uh, with uh, Professor Laura Arroyo on, on uh, crowd truth. You might not be able to get one answer out of, a, out of a group of people, but you might find a distribution of answers of what people find biased or not, um, or contentious, or some other dimension of what we're interested in here. So um, maybe we should think about our AI problems also as not, you know, our evaluation is not black or white. It's not good or bad or correct or incorrect but you know in certain situations this is correct and in other situations this is correct uh so i think we also need to rethink that part of our, our experiments no. which is going to make it so hard to publish this stuff <laughs> no indeed i agree but this is also from my perspective this is also why i, I really like the approach of surfacing biases because i think it's already very ambitious enough so to say but then uh, also that would allow for a broader conversation to mm -hmm. uh, take place right because these are also decisions that i i personally feel all, all, always a little bit uh, not at ease in making decisions for society i don't speak for society right i mean it's mm -hmm. like uh, the job description is is a bit more limited than that right so uh, and uh, indeed these things one once they have been manifested, once they have been uh, put to the fore, then we can have a discussion and then, and then we can take a decision in a, in, a, in a better way, I think more informed way at the very least. Um, so there is a question from uh, Nane van Nord, and, um, which is also related to, to cultural AI, and I'll, I'll try to summarize it. So uh, Nane is saying that some concepts, when, when they are important, when they, 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 they come into AI, they uh, they get impoverished in a certain sense mm. uh, exactly because they need to be to be useful in, in operationally uh, they need oftentimes to be very uh, strictly defined and uh, and that might mean losing some aspects of yeah. uh, of of those concepts and examples that nana gives are those of attention diversity and perhaps even bias so Nane is uh, is pointing out that uh, the same might happen to culture um, quotation marks if we if we bring it to AI as one of these uh, of these concepts and uh, perhaps that might be um, on the one hand unavoidable but also uh, yeah, not necessarily a positive thing right I mean it's, mm. it, it comes as a, 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 at a loss. So uh, Nana is asking, how do you see culture as a concept being integrated in AI, potentially without this happening? Or is culture AI by definition supposed to be somewhat separated from AI research at large to avoid this risk? Well, I think, I think for us, um, I mean, of course we need to have a Title: Culture AI Lab, 
uh, but there's of course all you know if you want to be specific um, the use cases we have for example are very western cultural uh, and you could even nah, not just not just high culture but uh, very much um, stuff you see in museums because we work with museums we don't do anything at the moment for example with uh, street culture or um, all sorts of other interesting uh, initiatives that are, are happening but that are not currently captured in the the data as we have available for example um, so there's all sorts of um, uh, uh, sort of uh, specifications but if you really want to be precise as a researcher we're, we're just doing this part of culture which is really this and we're also for example at the moment not doing um, computer vision or music uh, or, or those kind of things um, so in, in that sense we're uh, we're currently limited in the use case that we we can address because there's only so many of us at the moment um, but I think that this is really where the uh, hopefully our uh, the humanists on our team will will um, uh, uh, provide the um, tegenwicht. What the hell is that in, in Dutch? So, so the, the the force against flattening these concepts, um, and and this is sometimes where indeed some natural friction uh, happens in in how do you collaborate, how do you go about things, um, and that is not to say that uh, it can be completely prevented. Um, but I think our main aim is to stay as, as open-minded as possible. And therefore, I also don't want to uh, really define culture uh, specifically because, well, first of all, the, the, the part humanist in me thinks it can't really be defined because it's almost everything um, that you can think of. It, it permeates everything. Uh, all our data, all our expressions, um, but indeed we have to make choices in in the use cases we can uh, we can deal with now, and then we can only hope to to keep an open mind and to and to keep our methods as generalizable as possible, um, so that hopefully um, it also works for these other expressions uh, and these other subdomains. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think it makes a lot of sense, at least to me. And uh, it also uh, kind of hints at your answer to uh, my next question that I'll, I'll still ask for the record. <laughs> um, but also because of, of, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, so the first two, I'm curious about your uh, your take on this. Uh, the first two humane conversations have mm. fostered uh, Professor Max Velling, who is renowned expert in AI, and Professor Beate Rosler, who is a renowned expert in ethics. And um, they have uh, they have uh, both, let's say, commented on uh, their position in terms of how to have this exchange across disciplines on the topic of AI, and in particular, the application of AI in society. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to really simplify, Max suggested that, uh, according to him, there should be a kind of division of intellectual labor, right? On, on, on one side, we have the AI people developing algorithms, et cetera, that's basic research. And then only when those are used mm -hmm. in what the EU uh, regulation would call high-risk applications, then we need to have a conversation with, with uh, humanities experts too. You know, help us criticize and contextualize. Well, instead, Beate was advocating for a very different approach, which is uh, let's integrate from the very beginning. Let's have ethics taught as AI programs at the university. Let's work together from the very beginning, and let's you know that might lead to some clashes, but it's going to be much more productive. And my question is, what uh, what is your point of view, and how do you roll at the cultural AI lab? Well, I mean, I, I think I think Tobias knows the answer. You should know because um, we currently have a book chapter under review that has a title that's a little bit like this one. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go farther, go together. Nice. Um, I, th I think Max is wrong there. I'm, I'm with Beata there. Um, I mean, the thing is that I've I've seen, you know, if if you start building something. You build something and it's, it's a big thing and then you know all the way to the finish line you realize that 
you hadn't taken this into account or you, this ethics thing, which can be kind of tricky and can really affect the entire thing you did. Um, or indeed you forgot about this user group that wasn't on your radar because you didn't bring an anthropologist in there. And also let's face it. Um, I mean, I saw another list of the most influential people in AI um, uh, the other day and uh, sorry to say, but they were all almost all guys uh, and almost all, all white. Um, how can you then think that you can develop tools that are useful to everyone if uh, you know you have a particular view on the world so um, to be honest our cultural AI team at the moment is is also quite uh, uh, you know uh, white <laughs> from a Western uh, we look at, at things mostly from a Western perspective I mean we do have loads of different nationalities in the in the team um, and, and also people coming from different um, uh, different backgrounds, so from computer science, from philosophy, from museology, from journalism. Uh, so, and, and that all blends and that really, really adds. Um, and I, I think you need these diverse teams and, and you need to bring the user groups in there. So I would say definitely do, do it together. And, you know, I, I would advocate for um, all computer science students to uh, to have at least a philosophy course and you know ethics course and a, a basic humanities maybe, maybe not all the way to a liberal arts degree as, as they they have in, in, the, in the US but also I mean it's not a bad idea um, and for humanities students to have a programming course mm. uh, and not to become amazing developers but to to familiarize themselves with the way of thinking um, so that they can uh, more easily talk to a computer scientist if they do decide to work together. Because uh, you need this understanding uh, and because and the, the cultures between the research groups, are, uh, research disciplines are just so big. Um, and, and some of these problems are just too important to just leave to, to one discipline. I'm really on the do it together bandwagon. Yeah, that was very clear. I like the idea, both having those courses for AI students and also for the humanists. And it's like, it's also what we do already, especially with Tobias. So. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I feel also quite old now because I think we all studied computer science once in our lives. And in my undergrad days, we actually had to take an ethics course. In, um, and computer science, of course, has a very long tradition. So what went wrong? Of, yeah, no, in the 1980s, actually, computer scientists stopped uh, Reagan's uh, space defense system program. You know, and it was also computer scientists who were the first who to react to the Snowden revelations. Mm. So I think it's sort of say this, it is a little bit um, strange to make this distinction, if you ask me. And in particular strange, of course, if you have a machine learning system that learns from human data anyway. So it's very hard to see how you cannot ask certain questions about this. Do you agree? I, well, I mean, I, in, in, I, I can do a, Can we do a poll with the audience now? <laughs> <laughs> we should do a poll, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, in, in, uh, in terms of trying to also to, to, to interpret what Max was saying, I, I, I see there a hint at the possible, um, you know, I, I think what he's hinting at, but we should ask him, is that there are some fundamental mathematical truths, right? And, and no matter who discovers them, if we believe in mathematics, then they work or not, right? So in, in that sense, that work is in a sense universal, right? At least mathematics. And, uh, and, and for that, in that respect, probably for according to him, it doesn't matter um, whether we have collaborations or not. And when we move to applications, then uh, that becomes crucial. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit more charitable. <laughs> I'm quite charitable to that viewpoint because I think there is a, yeah, if we talk about the mathematical fundamentals, then uh, it shouldn't matter who is uh, working on them and discovering them. So maybe that was uh, his no, no, I mean, I, I think, and, and that's also very much, I guess, you know, so with fundamental research, you know, you sometimes do need to lock up, lock yourself up and just work through a theory or a thing, but um, then to take that theory out into, you know the real world um that's hard and you know there's also also usually all sorts of other influences 
you know, from real world data is messy and incomplete and uh, humans don't behave as they should uh, sometimes and uh, all sorts of things that, you know, what works on paper doesn't work in the real world. Um, and that's where you need the people who maybe understand the real world a little bit better and then try to bridge that. Yeah, totally. Exciting I, moments I, in our lives. That's why we need to cultural AI lab even more. So thank you exactly. that all these conversations <laughs> can take place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I, I also think pretty much everybody in that conversation would agree on that. So. Um, okay, um, Tobias, how are we doing with respect to time? Because yeah. I, have, I have a very last question, but... We are, we um, are almost, but I mean, please feel free to, this is a virtual space, nobody's standing outside demanding <laughs> access to the room. So um, I think, sure. Please answer that. Please answer. Please ask the last question. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll try but to be quick. Uh, so a lot of Zoom meetings today. You know the feeling, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> no, fair enough. So I'll try to be very quick. And Marika, I, I really would like to have a, a return from you from a cultural AI perspective on the uh, new EU uh, proposed regulation for AI. Of mm. course, that, that is really too broad, but I've singled out a couple of uh, concepts that I think are, and the spirit of the, I think it's very important to start the conversation. So I, I found it laudable that they have at least tried and started mm. and take no, it's easy to take flack when you do that. So, um, so having said that very, very clearly up front, uh, I think there are uh, several places there are, there is a need or a, a position that is taken in terms of trying to make, um, to define things that I find are very, very complicated to define operationally right and we go back to the discussion that we had a few minutes ago a um, couple of examples are high risk applications which mm -hmm. should be uh, uh, screened much more than other applications which are those that manipulate human behavior to circumvent users free will i'm quoting <laughs> or another example is high quality data and I'm quoting again this is data that is sufficiently relevant representative and free of errors and complete in view of the intended purpose of the system. Um, so a very quick question up to, to a very simple uh, problem. What do you think about this from a cultural AI perspective? Well, very simple. I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you that it's laudable that they want to, you know, protect citizens. Uh, I, I think there's a little bit of, um, I, th I think, I mean, I think the problem is that I it's it's unbe unbelievably hard to 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 um, to enforce this. I mean, you know, what does that even mean? A high risk application. I mean, a museum website that has ideas from two hundred years ago that were, uh, you know, that has the record from two hundred. Uh, what uh, the National Archives uh, recently, uh, only last week, uh, released a whole uh, data set about uh, you know slavery documents. Um, people could read that and get all sorts of weird ideas uh, if they're in some weird kind of bubble. Is that a high risk application? Um, that data, uh, you know, it was created years and years and years and years ago. It was digitized now, um, uh, but there's things missing. It needs to be contextualized. Uh, how, how? And there's so much data. I mean, how do you even, you know, make sure that people building applications use data that is uh, relevant and complete and error-free and, and all those laudable things that they mention. If, if we're using all these big data sets that you know, we use AI technology for exactly because they're too big to manually analyze. So, so how do you do that? So I think, I think it's really interesting and I, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, so um, I, I, I don't know how they think they're going to be able to enforce it or to really, really check it or, or, you know, how to say, well, this falls within a definition or this doesn't. Um, I think that um, what does stem from it is that it really kind of reading between the lines is that, you know, they, they kind of want you, you know, not just machines, but people and machines this sort of interplay, um, which I think is very much cultural AI, but um, I, I think I, I stopped reading at page 40 because uh, it's a very, very dense document. A bit um, long. <laughs> there's a lot in there, but um, 
I, th I think I think it's I think it's really really hard, and I I don't know where this is going. Whether it's actually gonna, whether they will be able to put it into a law and then do something useful with it. Yeah, fair enough. I think this is very reasonable, and the my the the side of me that deals with startups and work with startups is a little bit worried about that challenge yeah. because it it leaves us with a bit of a vacuum. Well, but even uh, that, not just for startups, but what does it mean for, for us as researchers? Because mm -hmm. we want to use this data all the time that wasn't meant for, wasn't created for the purpose that we want to use it for. I mean, we use the Dutch East India records that were created 300 years ago to keep track of who worked for them when. And now we think it's an interesting peek into um, uh, maritime uh, careers, right? Um. Yeah, I remember the debates as in the archives community after the GDPR came out. In a way, the whole point about archives is to represent important people and events. And the GDPR more or less said they all have the right to be forgotten. I now simplify this. So, what's <laughs> going to happen with archives? And yeah, I know. Do, do we want the, all the crimes of our politicians to be easily forgotten? So. I suspect strongly this will be only the beginning of a very long journey through this kind of legislation. Yeah, fair enough. But it's a noble attempt, I should say, if, if somebody from the European New, uh, Commission watches this, this and wants to fund me for some more research, <laughs> I can say that I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, super. Well, on that note, I think we can bring this to a close. And uh, well, on my side, thank you very much, Marika. It was very really insightful. Very much. And uh, look forward to 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 what you will do, uh, and we will also do a collaboration uh, within the cultural AI umbrella. And uh, thank you for all uh, that have attended and asked questions. And also thank you for all of you that will watch this later on. Um, Tobias, would you like to yeah, no, that's formally? The, I mean, I'm, there's nothing left for me to say apart from uh, the next um, humane eye, eye conversation will actually be between um, Beate Rösler and Max Welling to oh, pick up sense. on that conversation. And we haven't really found a date yet, but it will be somehow before.